And part of that grief should be an actual removal from your midst, a removal from your congregation, a removal from your fellowship, the one who did this, the one who was engaged in this relationship with the stepmom. Uh, church discipline. A rarely practiced, long neglected act of love and concern. Now just in case you didn't catch how I phrased that, let me read it again. A rarely practiced, long neglected act of love and concern. Really? Love and concern? The title of my sermon is taken from the last sentence of verse 5. Paul's going to say something in the first part of that verse that sounds really harsh to us. Hand this one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Woo! Why? So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. See, this isn't a, you're disgusting, we don't want you around, get out of here attitude. This is a, we love you too much to self-destruct we want you to be close to Jesus. We want you on the day of the Lord to hear Him say, enter into my rest. This is a love motivation. See the difference? I think the struggle that churches and even Christians have had for so long is that too often we sound like the former. Harsh disciplinarians rather than the latter, loving caregivers. You see, if we look at a few other texts, you hear Paul, James, and John saying the same thing over and over again. In the book of Galatians, chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves, so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens in this way, and you will fulfill the law of Christ. James tells us in his book, chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, it's the last paragraph of his letter, My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. John says, If anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin that doesn't lead to death, he should ask, and God will give life to him. Do we love one another enough to interfere in each other's lives? You know, which one of us who is a parent or a grandparent never took action to correct the errant behavior of a child? You know? when I tried to set the neighbor's apple tree on fire, after my mom put the fire out, she lit up my backside. Did she not love me? Did she not just want to let me do whatever I wanted to do? But see, that's the attitude of our world. Who are you to tell me what I ought to do, how I ought to think, how I ought to live? And when that attitude enters into the church, Paul says we have a big, big problem. And so he addresses his situation specifically. He talks about this man who, it's interesting, he doesn't talk about mom here. He just talks about the man. It makes you kind of wonder. Some authors say that maybe she was not Christian. Um, some say because of that cultural time when men were men and women were just, well, less than important. It didn't matter. We, we don't really know why. But he says, 
this man, I want you to hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to define that. I'm going to give you what I've got, okay? Paul does the same in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, where he actually names two people in particular by name and calls them out for their opposition to the gospel and says, I'm handing them over so that they might learn not to blaspheme, handing them over to Satan. Now, we don't want Satan to drag anybody to that bad place, do we? And so Paul says, I want you to hand him over for the destruction of the flesh, for, so that the destruction of this, these sinful desires and the sinful behavior can be addressed and rooted out. If you have a New International Version, it'll say that the sinful nature, rather than flesh, that the sinful nature may be destroyed. And so I simply wrote in my notes this little word, how. By barring him from all that gives life in the Christian experience. Being removed from the fellowship. He doesn't get to come and partake of this holy meal where we share in the bread and the cup, the body and the blood, barred from the table, where his relationship with the Christian family takes on a new dimension, a different dimension, whereas before we live as brothers and sisters. You know, how many of you have siblings? Any only children here? Eh, there's a couple. All right. But as siblings, and I realize not all families are the same, and I realize some families have problems, okay? I'm speaking very generally here. You can sure fight with your siblings, but let the neighbor kids fight with your siblings. It's a different story. So I might fight with you, but boy, if those Methodists want to mess with you, nah, sorry. But if that world wants to mess with you, that's another story, okay? Because we're family. Paul's talking about, for this fellow, removing from that sense of family and treat him as an outsider, as an unbeliever, as a non-Christian. And so our relationship is no longer, aren't we glad to be a part of the family of God? It's you're not even a Christian, wouldn't you like to be a part of the family of God? The discipline is meant to cause someone to long for, to desire that which brings life, to desire Christ, and therefore to humbly and repentantly return. The problem is, 2,000 years after this was written, we Christians have kind of begun to undervalue the things that give life. Oh, the table? Yeah. I'll get there once in a while. I think I've told this story before because it's one of my favorites, but if I haven't, it's a new one to you. President James Garfield, briefly president, he was assassinated early in his tenure, general of the Union Army in the Civil War, his president, his secretary of state comes to him, a very pressing matter with one of our European allies, and he has set up an appointment for him on Sunday morning. Garfield's response was this, you will have to alter the meeting, reschedule it. His secretary of state was stunned. He said, why? This is a very important matter of international policies. Garfield's response was, I have a standing meeting with my Lord at his table every Sunday morning, and I will not neglect it. Can you imagine a president of the United States saying that today? I don't care which party he's from. It ain't going to happen. I have a standing appointment with my Lord at his table. Oh, it's a sunny day. Think I'll mow the yard. I was out much too late for a man of God on Saturday night. Think I'll sleep in. Jesus has invited me to his table. You see, that's the difference. In first century Corinth, that man would be told, no, you can't, and it would have broken his heart. 
in 21st century America, we go, hey, I'll get around to it when I get around to it. It makes it hard to practice what Paul's telling us to practice. You see, there was one church in Corinth. No, it met in a lot of different little households, kind of like our small groups. But we're still one church. In our day and age, when you try to practice something like this, people go, fine, I'll just go to another church. I'll go to a Presbyterian church, a Methodist church, a Baptist church, a Disciples church, a Catholic church, an Eastern Orthodox church, another Christian church. Who are you to judge me? Isn't that the human approach and attitude? It's hard. It's hard. But sometimes we have to practice tough love. Because what is the goal? Repentance. That his spirit might be saved. Repentance. That's why I said early on that the problem was a celebration and acceptance of unrepented sin. You see, if I said this morning, if you have sin in your life, please don't come back, none of us would be here next week, would we? And unfortunately, I would probably have to lead the exodus. I'm not going to stand up here and confess my sins to you because one, we don't have time, and two, I'd be too embarrassed. I am so thankful for the grace of God. So thankful. But there is a big difference in attitudes between I have a bad attitude, I have anger issues, that's just how I am, it's in my DNA and you're just going to have to put up with it. And saying, I really have issues with anger. And I want to humbly and prayerfully and biblically let the Holy Spirit work in me to overcome that. Will you walk with me? Will you help me become more like Christ? See the two different attitudes? And we can do that with any sin on the books. Some people just say, this is mine, this is who I am. No. It might be who you are, but God is in the business of transforming. Death to the sinful nature. That what? That his flesh might be destroyed. Death to the sinful nature. And a recreation in Christ which makes us new. That's the difference. That's what he's talking about here. Matter of fact, Paul has to write in his second letter about the same man. Okay, the same situation that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 5, he addresses in 2 Corinthians 2. In 2 Corinthians 2, beginning at verse 5, Paul says, If anyone has caused pain, and he's talking about this man and what he caused in turmoil in the church, he has caused pain not so much to me, but to some degree, and not to exaggerate, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is sufficient for that person. He's talking about they followed through with Paul said. They practiced church discipline. They deprived him of fellowship. And it was sufficient. Verse 7, as a result, you should instead forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overwhelmed by excessive grief. You see... If we don't forgive, if we don't comfort, the grief sweeps over and crushes and destroys. And so he says, therefore, in verse 8, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. Reaffirm your love to him. I wrote for this purpose to test your character to see if you're obedient to everything. Anyone you forgive, I do too. For what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it is for your benefit in the presence of Christ so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan. We are not ignorant of his schemes. Isn't that neat? So I'm going to ask you this. Do you love me enough that if you were cognizant, if you were aware of any unrepentant sin in my life, you'd sit me down over a cup of coffee and hold my feet to the fire and say I love you too much to let you be self-destructive? Do you love the people gathered in this room this morning enough that if you were cognizant of unrepented sin in their life, that you would sit down with them and say, Jesus loves you too much. Jesus paid too much of a price. We can't continue this way. 
Do we love each other? See, that's, that's, that's what he said. Reaffirm your love for them. That's what he says. Man, have I got a rush. I have six minutes left to do two-thirds of my sermon. All right. Chapter 5, 1 Corinthians, beginning of verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as indeed you are. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I find it very interesting that Paul speaks to a Gentile, a non-Jewish congregation, utilizing a very Jewish picture, the Passover meal. Passover, go back to the book of Genesis. The, uh, the, the Hebrew people have been 400 years slaves to the Egyptians. They cry out to God. God sends Moses, 10 plagues. The tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. And blood, the sacrificial blood of a lamb painted on the doorposts of the Jewish homes told the death angel, pass over this home. No death here. And Jesus is our Passover, we're told. This is the heart of the message, folks. Jesus, he says, is our Passover. Jesus has been sacrificed for us. Death sees his blood over us and passes over. No eternal death. No damnation. And he uses the picture of leaven because they had to hurry. They had to hurry. When the Egyptians say, get out, because these ten plagues were so intense, you've got to be ready to go. If you're cooking, ladies, you don't have time to put yeast into the dough. No time to wait for it to rise. Make your bread unleavened so you'll have food to eat on the journey. Hurry, 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 hurry. And even today, interestingly enough, in an Orthodox Jewish home at Passover, which is always right before our Easter, they remove all yeast from their homes. Even those little yellow packets of Fleischmann's has to go. No yeast in the home. Because they're celebrating the Passover. And Paul uses that imagery for a non-Jewish congregation in Corinth. And he, he talks about leaven. And he uses the word leaven to kind of illustrate that idea of sin. And here's the point. Sin is contagious. Sin is contagious. He says, get rid of that old leaven. Your boasting of, of sinful tolerance isn't good. Of tolerance of sinful behavior. Don't you understand, just a little bit of leaven, just a little bit of yeast leavens the entire batch of dough. So clean out the old leaven. It is a danger to all. And as I was writing that, I thought about these last two years. Whatever your take on the COVID stuff, for two years, we have been very cautious. We've, we've practiced social distancing. We, for quite some time, uh, the reason we have two services is for quite some time we wanted people to spread out. And in between those two services, some very kind volunteers would come in and wipe down these pews just in case, you know, there were germs that had been on people's hands. We we're very cautious. People have worn masks so that they didn't spread to others nor take in from others. People have gotten vaccines. We've done a number of things to guard our physical health. And as I read about sin being contagious and clearing out the old leaven, I wondered, are we taking any precautions for our spiritual health? We're so physically afraid of COVID, but so spiritually nonchalant about sin. Maybe we need a spiritual mask or a spiritual vaccine. What could it be? The things that give life. That which the Corinthian church would have barred that man from. We need. Be at this table. Not just as a ritual. Oh, it's the end of the service. Bill's going to lead us in communion. No. The bread and the cup, the body, the blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Pray. To take in Scripture, to worship, to walk with one another and encourage each other. Because I'll tell you, I need you. And whether you realize it or not, we need each other to do the things that give life. That is our inoculation. 
And then he says something really interesting. He makes a bold statement. He says, you are a new batch. He doesn't say become a new batch of dough, a new unleavened bread. He says, you are this new batch. This is your identity. It is who you are. You have been made holy. How? By Christ our Passover being sacrificed. By His crucifixion. He has borne our sin. He has borne our guilt. Do you understand that in 1 Corinthians 5, trying to call a man out of incest, grace covers that. And we go, oh, grace covers that. And even worse, the arrogant ignorance of a church that said, hey, we can do anything we want to. When you come to repentance, grace covers that. Grace is greater. I read that somewhere. I don't remember where it was. For those of you in small groups, you get that. We're, we've been made new. The old is gone, the new has come. We are new creatures in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so he says, we come to the table. We observe the feast. Untainted by our past sins. And so we set aside all malice and all evil. Even malice towards someone who might have brought sin into our midst. Rather we embrace truth and sincerity. The truth who is Christ embodied. The truth which is the gospel proclaimed. And the sincerity of a faith that holds on to it. I'm rushing a little bit now because I did spend too much time on my first point. But the latter part of the chapter says this. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. <laughs> I love the way Paul writes. But actually, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. For what business is it of, us, is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outsiders. Remove the evil person from among you. Now again, <laughs> Paul identifies a couple of problems. One I'm not going to spend much time on is this. Again, don't think he's saying that if anybody has committed a sin or struggles with a sin or even has an addiction, <laughs> all right, that you have to get rid of them. He's not talking about people who are trying to overcome their sin and who recognize their sin and who just struggle with sin. The ancients used to call them besetting sins. Anyone ever hear that phrase? The besetting sin, the sin that was kind of, it just clamped onto you and you were having a terribly hard time of getting rid of it. He's talking about unrepented sin. And he says, so within the church, Bill claims to be a, a brother in Christ, and yet the man is a compulsive liar. Don't even go out to lunch with him after church on Sunday. Let him feel the separation of the body so that his soul will long to be restored. That's what he's saying. Okay? Now just because Bill happens to be a liar and he's trying to overcome that, then you can still go out to lunch with him. And I'm going to leave that hanging there and let you guys just guess. But he says, and here's, here's how I put it. There's, there's something important in this paragraph, and I'm not going to spend much time it's the error of looking in the wrong direction. It's the error of being concerned about the wrong people's sin. Did you notice how I said in my previous letter, interestingly enough, a letter we don't have, lost to us, I wrote to you not to associate with certain kinds of sinful behaviors. And by that, I don't mean the people of the world. I mean people who profess Christ, but whose lies don't match their profession. Okay? All this stuff that we've been talking about this morning. But here's the problem. We Christians excel at judging the world and turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to the sin within the church. You see, it's easy for us to look outside our walls and look at the sinful world and say, oh, my, 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 everybody's just going to the bad place in a handbasket. You know, in our nation, 
Arguments in the Supreme Court. Can I kill a baby in the womb or not? Yes, baby. Do you know that the word fetus is only the Latin word for child? It's just a fetus. Ah, glad you know that. Word means child. God's mark of the covenant with Noah, a rainbow, taken over by a movement that would distort how God created man and woman. And we can sit and I can preach sermons and we can get real heated on, hot under the collar about what the world's doing. But here's the problem. We're expecting Christian behavior from non-Christian people. We're expecting regenerate behavior from unregenerate people. We're expecting Christ-following behavior from people who don't give two licks about Jesus. Well, we ourselves have a hard time living the life that he's called us to ourselves. Notice what Paul says. God will judge the world. You judge the brethren. We need to be, and I'm not saying unconcerned, but we need to be less concerned about what's going on out there and more concerned about what's going on in here so that we might be a light of the gospel and the eternal hope in a world that is terribly dark. That's what Paul's saying. That's what Paul's saying. Okay. It is hard. And I'm just going to confess to you. I struggle. I'm afraid that if I'm honest with brothers and sisters, if I, <laughs> if I love enough and care enough to be nosy in their lives, that they'll get mad at me. And I'm just the kind of personality, I don't want people to be mad at me. As a preacher, I don't want people to get mad and go to another church. I'm glad they're in church. They haven't left Jesus, but it bothers me when they leave. You know, so I'm, I try to, you know, walk on eggshells. But Paul would say, do you love enough? See, with all the harshness that we've put out here, don't miss that. Reaffirm your love. What is the purpose of church discipline, of the shunning, of the excommunication, of whatever we call it? It is for the sake of the salvation of individual souls. It is for the glory of God and the witness of His church. And so love one another enough to call each other to holiness, even if that love is a tough love. For love, it is. You know, folks, <laughs> there are passages in this book that as a preacher over 40 years, I've tried to sidestep at times. There, there's a lot of stuff in here. You just go, man, God really deals with that. Do I have to deal with that in a sermon? Here's what I think is funny. I'm going to do it again, Jen. I'm not picking on Jen. Jen was great. Two weeks ago, she comes up to me after church. We're over in the office. And she goes, because I give her about four or five, six weeks, sometimes one week, <laughs> advance notice of what I'm going to preach on so it helps her pick out songs. And she goes, do you know you're talking about incest on Mother's Day? <laughs> because I don't pay attention to holidays. I, I, in all honesty, I, I couldn't care less about U.S.-based holidays. Um, we celebrate them. I give my wife, well, actually I don't. I tell my kids, give your mother something. She's not my mother. My mother's dead, so I don't have to worry about it. You can rebuke me afterwards. Love me enough. Love me enough to hold my feet to the fire. But Jen said, do you realize you're preaching on, on incest on, on Mother's Day? And I said, no, I didn't realize that. So we did what? We did Psalm 63 last week, and we came back to 1 Corinthians today. But here's my point, folks, given that silliness there. I don't care what the topic. If God saw fit to put it on the pages of his book, it's important. If God saw fit to put it on the pages of his book, it's important. And not just for us to hear, but for us to live. Love one another. I have two things to give you as practice, and we're going to sing. One, love your brothers and sisters enough to poke your nose into their lives. Their souls matter. 
Secondly, be humble enough that if a brother or sister pokes his or her nose into your life, you listen. Don't get your hackles up. Don't get mad. Don't storm away. Just say, thanks for loving me. And loving me enough to interfere. That my spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Would you stand as we sing? as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Good morning. It's good to see you all in the Lord's house today. Uh, first, I want to say uh, prayers we had on there for my brother-in-law and cousin. They are home and doing well. I want to thank everybody for their prayers that they God helped heal them and get them back home. We come to this part of our service for the communion and I would read in one of my meditation books says why does Jesus love meal times well Luke 24 41 through 43 he says then he Jesus asked them do you have anything here to eat they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate as they watched doesn't seem a bit unusual that Jesus spent so much time eating and drinking with his disciples? What does stopping to have a meal have to do with anything? It's, some, it's sometimes people do all the time, which is exactly what Jesus seized upon. Repeatedly out through, throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus talked about the wonderful feast of the kingdom of heaven when the Lord would celebrate with the believers of all ages in glory. It's a banquet no one wants to miss. Then, right before his death, Jesus transformed the bread and wine of the Passover feast into a wonderful symbols 
of what Christian faith is all about. We all go through life having meals and eating and that stuff. Do you think about the Lord while you're having your meal? Do you thank Him for what He's blessed you with in your lives as you're partaking food with friends and family? Do you pray for your families? Do you uh, feel like, hey, I need to do more in my life to represent Jesus in this world? And then we take and remember that the wafer represents Jesus' broken body that he went to the cross on. The juice that we drink represents the shed blood that he shed for us so we could have everlasting life. Lord, we thank you for your son and then I have some third day when he rose again. Thank you for being with us every day of our lives and watching over us. You know what we do. You help us guide, guide us through our lives. Hopefully, Lord, we pray that you will be with us when we try to help other people in their lives, that they will accept our, our gift of love and caring for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're so happy that you were able to join us today, both in person and online. I hope that you have a blessed week. Would you please stand to sing with us?